Welcome. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you quickly about my background so that you guys don't have too many question marks. Um, I hail from the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, that's where I grew up as a kid, the northeastern section, anthracite coal. I went to California for school, got my undergraduate degree in biology at UCI, the anteaters, and went to USC for graduate school. Started a company out there dealing with compost bin distribution and rain barrel manufacturing. Did that till about 2007 and moved to North Carolina. Um, I also was the mayor of a city from 2001 to 2007, Aliso Viejo, which is the tract homes off of the toll road through Orange County. They all look alike, so you can't tell them apart. And it was definitely a, a wonderful experience. I got to do that. It's nice to say it, you got to be involved in that. I was also executive director of a nonprofit out there that oversaw uh, about 20,000 acres of prime coastal shrub habitat, which is the scrub uh, around the coast, which is um, most of the biodiversity. And unfortunately, it's the most imperiled, of course. Isn't that always how it works? Um, but now I'm here. I work for a company called Protoculture. We specialize in bioconversion technologies, which is a nice way of saying um, devices to grow maggots. Even though we don't call them maggots, and my boss would be very angry that I said that, They're, we actually call them grubs, even though technically they are maggots. Grubs is a lot nicer when you bring friends over to see your bin. You don't want to ever say maggot because then they start like up chucking in their mouth, and that's just not nice, especially if they're over for dinner. So do, do say grubs. It's a lot more of a nice euphemism for what we're going to talk about today. And I forgot to mention I have a 68-acre farm in Franklin County. I own it with two of my buddies, and I'm assistant uh, organizer for my transition group in the Piedmont. We're about, about 50 people right now, and we do reskilling workshops about every three weeks. And we try to learn all the stuff that we all knew generations ago but don't seem to know now. So that's what I do in my free time between 3 and 4 a.m. So, uh, okay, let's start and talk, we'll try to follow the agenda. And uh, why raise BSF? That is sort of the crux of why a lot of us are here. This species, believe it or not, is actually native to the southeast. And it is here, even though you may not see it, it is quite common. It's not going to be here in the cold months. It's, it's just like most insects. It's here in, in the temperate times. And uh, it has a profile that is extremely valuable from a nutrition standpoint. It's about 40% protein, about 35% fat. Uh, the fat is predicated on what food it eats. But there tends to be a lot of lauric acid in it, which is a good profile. And um, if you give it a lot of omega-3s, it'll have a lot of omega-3s. If you give it some of the omega-6s, it'll have omega-6s. Overall, its, its profile is not much different than other insects. And in that respect, it's very beneficial. Um, if you also look at uh, sort of the in, in, inorganic ma uh, matter in the, in the grub, it's about 5% by weight calcium. And Tim, why is that important? If you have chickens. You need calcium. Because the shell. It's absolutely critical. You won't have to go harvest the oyster beds, you know, uh, down in Asheville. Uh, there's not too many, but. <laughs> so, you know, you want to you you try to do as little as possible. And the, ha the fact that it's built in is really good. And it's bioavailable, which is even nicer. They don't have to really ingest it and digest it. It's just, it's there. Um, besides uh, feed for both chickens, fish, small pigs. This can actually be utilized for herps and amphibians. So if you have a bullfrog farm, or you want to raise koi, or you want to raise lizards, it's great for reptiles because of the calcium, but it's also good for um, songbirds. A lot of people who don't have necessarily a homesteading component of their life uh, will put it in bird feeders that normally house mealworms. So it's a great to sort of keep the diversity of songbirds maintained since most of their Central American habitat is being wiped out. You might want to just keep them around a couple generations longer because our grandkids might want to see them, you know, outside of a picture. So in that respect, you're helping the ecosystem, even if you don't use them personally for chicken or fish feed. Um, in regards to fish feed, we have some trial catfish farmers and trial bluegill farmers who are utilizing it, working out great. Because tilapia are vegetarians, they do eat insects, I would not make it a main diet component of their feed. So make sure if you're going to feed it to tilapia in your reconverted swimming pool, 
that you give them a diversity of food. Don't just give them black soldier fly. They're not pure carnivores. So I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Um, but why raise black soldier fly? What's, what's the purpose? Well, you're taking basically a waste stream or several different types of waste streams that are destined to the landfill normally, and you're diverting it, diverting it for what's going to probably be turned into methane, which affects climate about 20 times as bad as carbon dioxide. So by taking that waste stream out of the landfill, and by the way, only 3%, and I think that's actually generous, of food waste is actually recycled in this country. It needs to be a lot more. North Carolina, I think it's a little higher. Yeah, we're almost pushing 10. That's great. Yeah, but overall, I think average is dismal. Yeah, two and a half. So North Carolina is doing its part for sure, but uh, you're not going to have a shortage of uh, inputs for your bins. And um, so it's a great reason to do this alone, is just divert waste from the landfill. Another thing that black soldier fly, why grow it? Think about this way. Most people have mixed waste. Imagine you taking out the food component of your waste. All of a sudden, the recyclables are cleaner and more recoverable because they don't have all that food contamination. So you've ironically taken all the rest of your waste, made it cleaner, made it better for the people at the dirty MRF to actually separate, makes it more pleasant for everyone, less odor, less chance of having colorful critters enter your garbage can because there's no more organic waste in it. You've taken it out and, and given it a higher upcycling purpose. So there's a lot of reasons why you should grow black soldier fly. It's not just as the obvious one, which is chicken and fish feed. Now, raise your hands if you have chickens real quick. Oh, gosh, this is a wonderful group. I love it. Um, do you guys follow the golden rule of chicken feed about a third greens? a third critters and a third seeds and grains. Is that your, your recipe? Okay. Yeah, we just let them do it. Okay, good. So you pasture them? Yes. Oh, great, great, that's important. Um, the black soldier fly is the critter component of that golden rule, okay? The, the, gra the, the grains and seeds should come from things like sunflower, sorghum, milo, millet, everything you're growing on your farm that has a seed. Uh, brewery waste. Brewery waste, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, amaranth. I mean, there's so many different seeds out there that you can feed your um, uh, chickens. And then the, the greens, just the leafy greens, pastured stuff, you need that to sort of get the omega-3s and some of the other um, phytonutrients, which are critical. Um, if you're looking at about a third of a pound of feed per day for layers, I think that's what I feed ours, and you're looking at a third of a third, that's about one-ninth pound per chicken per day. So these big pods can handle about 25 to 35 chickens a day. These can handle about three to five. The baby pods are just to learn and practice. You know, it's like having a goldfish bowl just to get you up to the aquarium where you can swim in it. Uh, but it is absolutely invaluable to learn about um, the species because it's a very turnkey approach. It's hard to goof it up. We're going to go over ways that um, sort of tricks that we've learned. I've been doing this since about 2007, and I learn something every season. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's good to learn from your mistakes, but it's also good to hear about others' mistakes so that you can avoid them. Because avoidance is, is a lot easier. Um, because the one thing you don't want to do is deal with odors, especially if you're in a neighborhood. And odor abatement is um, important. Uh, Order, order production can be a real challenge, and I'll, I'll go over how we can mitigate that.